Hi everyone, uh, thanks for coming down. I know it's um, relatively late in the day if you've had a long night last night. I hear it was a bit fun. <laughs> um, thanks for coming down to our eSports chat. Um, my name is Roisin. I actually work for Fnatic, which is uh, one of the world's biggest um, eSports organizations. Um, I am a last minute addition to the panel, <laughs> uh, but I'm moderating, so it's okay. Um, so we are hopefully going to shed some light on esports and the link to football. Obviously, you're, you're all aware of what's happening. Um, but we want to go into a little bit of more depth for you guys, um, hopefully answer some of your questions, um, and also, I think, inspire you to maybe explore some options within esports. Um, I've got a great panel with me today. Um, Slightly biased in that I have one colleague from Fnatic on the panel also, but um, I have Colin Johnson from Fnatic, Frederick Mopan um, from Ares. Ares, and Pablo Ortiz <laughs> <laughs> from Deportivo, but from you can, I want you all to introduce yourselves <laughs> actually. Yeah, so Colin, do you want to go? Yeah, uh, my name's Colin Johnson, as Roisin said. Um, I work for Fnatic, but uh, I am kind of the connective tissue between uh, Fnatic and AS Roma and the relationship that we have with our FIFA team. Um, so currently my day-to-day -day duties are kind of the day-to-day -day operations of the team, as well as making sure that both Fnatic and AS Roma are kind of satisfied with uh, the way the organization is moving and the way the team is operating. Uh, I'm Frédéric Maupin, French, so apologize for the, the accent. <laughs> <laughs> I'm working for RS, or at least uh, like uh, many uh, eSports <coughs> players, I'm in transition uh, to get the general management of this uh, startup. We are a startup based in Paris, founded a few months ago, and what we aim to do is to uh, set up uh, a tournament to uh, to get uh, as many uh, it's like a, a goal um, goal finding you know you get the latest uh, the, the biggest one you shake you shake you shake and uh, to detect the best uh, golden nuggets available on the uh, uh, esports market hi i'm pablo ortiz and working for deportivo la vez that is a football club and then we, we in the organization, we also have a basketball team in EuroLeague level called Basconia, and also um, an eSports club called uh, Basconia eSports. And then uh, I'm very proud to say that we are the current champions in Spain of uh, League of Legends. So we are very happy with the, with the player right now. Cool. So we have a nice mix of uh, you know, rights holders, <coughs> basically. Um, what I want to start with, I mean, what I'd be interested to know from the audience from the start is um, where you guys are from. So are you from clubs? Anyone? Agencies who are interested in esports and football? Anything else that kind of you're from organizations that would be slightly interesting to these guys in terms of why you're here talking about esports? Anyone? Want to add? No, okay, just football clubs and agents. Okay, cool. Um, all right, well, one of the biggest drawing points is uh, the numbers in esports. It's kind of hard to ignore now. Um, anyone who works in sport, you know, it's all about engagement, it's about increasing those revenues. Um, within esports, it, again, it's really hard to ignore. We have huge numbers, viewing figures, streamers, online gamers. Um, in terms of FIFA, um, it's not the biggest game in esports. Um, Colin, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what is FIFA in the in the scope of esports? Where does it sit? Yeah. So um, up until about two or three years ago, um, we would probably consider ourselves like a third tier esport. Um, I would probably say there's a solid three tiers to esport, and we were definitely closer to the bottom. Um, not only because of people not watching us, but the money just wasn't there. 
Um, just for example, uh, the 2016 FIFA Interactive World Cup Grand Finals, uh, the grand prize for that was $20,000, and that's like our World Cup equivalent. Um, this year, it was 200000 So you can kind of see right there the, the growth that we've seen. But in regards to, to viewership, comparatively to other esports like you know, Counter-Strike, League of Legends, the ones you guys already know about, um, our numbers aren't there necessarily. But I think that's more so because it's spread among so many different places. People consume the content in so many different ways. Because uh, you can consume FIFA esports on Facebook Live, on YouTube Gaming, on Twitch, and as well as all of the broadcast deals that have been coming out recently, what with the BN Sports deal in France or the ESPN deal for the EA uh, Foot Championship Series. Um, it's definitely growing, and uh, EA is positioning the game in a way that um, it's definitely esports focused, and the viewership is uh, definitely trending more so towards getting the pro gamers in front of as many eyes as possible. So I feel like EA, if EA's main focus is getting is making that happen, then it's going to happen eventually. It's just waiting for it to catch on a little bit, as well with the uh, the main viewership for FIFA. Just as an example, on YouTube, we're like the third or fourth biggest game for games that are consumed on YouTube. Um, and mainly that content is more so casual. It's like pack openings, it's squad builders, it's different like challenges and stuff. But over the past year, we've seen a trend where the casual content has kind of gone down a little bit and the competitive content has been on the upturn. So um, the game has definitely been growing a lot. And I think that FIFA 18, in the way that uh, uh, EA has positioned it, it's only going to get bigger. So. I want to talk about that in a minute. Yeah, sure. um, but so um, with you, Fred, um, in terms of the games that your organization are, inv are involved with, you are going into FIFA. We do. Uh, we do because we have a, a native base of football players uh, supporting us. We've got a supporting cast with uh, 10 uh, pro, pro professional players. And Naturally, uh, they play FIFA, they want a FIFA team with them, and um, what we can do is to bring uh, um, their ex uh, mediatic exposure to the game. So uh, what we try to do is to get as many people as possible joining us for the tournament, and then uh, when, you g uh, when you reach the last, uh, the last round of qualification and when you get to win this tournament, you'll have to, to join our professional team. So FIFA team as well, but okay. not only FIFA team. We've uh, managed to, uh, to organize uh, this tournament on seven games. But just to be honest, uh, the, the football players, they all, all want to be uh, the ambassador of the FIFA team. Right. So you're, you're as an organization, <coughs> you're motivated by the FIFA element of what you can do. We know it's not the the major uh, um, game on Twitch. It's like you know, we were talking about uh, it's one of ten mm, in, um, against uh, League of Legends. But the fact that big uh, games uh, player like uh, like AS Roma, like uh, we've met a lot of people here uh, coming from uh, clubs I can't mention, but um, they're looking forward to uh, to have their own FIFA team. They're looking forward to to structure the game. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we can help with them is that we can provide uh, good players, maybe, maybe not as good as fanatic ones, <laughs> but uh, we'll, g we'll try to, to challenge you, okay. <laughs> say you, Bring it on. Uh, in the years <laughs> to come. Um, so Pablo, in terms of what you guys are doing as a football club and a basketball club, um, it would be the assumption that you would probably have a FIFA team. Well. The first thing I would like to say is uh, we have to make a difference between gaming and eSports. Normally the concept is uh, a bit diffuse. Uh, uh, in my opinion, in our opinion, if you have an audience, if people is watching, then it's eSports. If not, it's gaming. So there is a lot of publishers that make in games that they want to have a, a eSport game that everybody plays in a competitive way the game. But none of them, not all of them get in. So the reality is we are playing in the games that we think that the, the people and the audience is watching to. So in my opinion, in our opinion, uh, today we don't have a big competitive sport game. Like it's not in basketball. Football, the audience are growing. It's grow it depends on the new version of the team, of the game, the new FIFA, 
or the new versions and everything, but today it's in the edge of, of, uh, of this line. There is like eight or ten games that uh, we, we prioritize yeah. uh, before, before FIFA. So as an organization then, uh, you guys got into eSports about three years ago. Yeah. Why? It's <laughs> a good question. <laughs> uh, the reason that we get in is because uh, there is, a, there is a, a way to bring new people to our brands, to be closer to, to Basconia, to be closer to Alaves, to, be, uh, to get more fan base around, to a specific target that we don't get very easy, then it's easy to get from another ways, that the brands, our brands, our sponsor, are not able to, to go to, this, uh, to these people. So then we give them a possibility to reach this target um, in another field, in another, in another sport. Uh, we don't necessarily need that these followers or these fans comes to football or comes to basketball. We just have three uh, divisions and we're happy that the, our fans move uh, free from one to the other. Right, so you have an extra group of fans yeah. to your, and also um, an extra way for your sponsors to yeah. activate um, and hopefully uh, another revenue stream as well. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in terms of um, one of the things about esports and uh, if you're not in it, a lot of brands, a lot of sports organizations worry about the violence in some of the titles. Some of the biggest titles for example, CSGO is the good guys versus the terrorists, and you, 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 know, you, you kill each other, and then you switch places. You become the terrorists and the good guys and whatever. Um, ha FIFA is obviously a safe bet. Football is consumed all over the world. It's, it's inclusive. It's all of that. It's safe for brands um, and investors. How would a sports body tackle the idea of these violent games versus FIFA. Um, should they be just considering FIFA because it's safe, or should they be considering the CSGOs and all of those, uh, Call of Duty and all of those others? Colin, what do you think? Uh, yeah, um, f to start, it's obviously easier to just go with FIFA. Um, I feel like to kind of get down the strategy that you want to implement, um, you definitely need to like talk to your brands, your sponsors, the different stakeholders that are involved because say you have American owners or something like that and then uh, you know the situation in America is a little bit tense right now when it comes to terrorism and obviously in Europe right now, in the UK as well. So I think you just have to be really careful the way you position the content that you create around the game as well um, and maybe put the players forward more so than the actual gameplay. Um, because when you really break the game down, it is genuinely terrorists killing a counter-terrorist force and the other way around. Um, so FIFA is definitely the easiest way for clubs to get involved at first and then maybe expand into other games is the way I would do it. But I know Pedro has a different opinion yeah. on that a little bit. So. <laughs> you have a very interesting opinion on that, actually. Well, the, the reality is Call of Duty is, uh, I think, is number one played game in the world. And uh, it's a gun game. And the, the, the question would be if the kids can play this or not. The reality they're doing. Mm. Even the, the target of this game is they're even younger than the average of eSport. So for us, if you have a, the society is playing this game, everybody accepting, and there is a professional game around it, we play it. Because it's what, what these people is doing. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then, so Fred, for you, um, you see it as an opportunity, really. Um, you know, yes, you have a terrorist game or, or, you know, fighting violence games, but what you don't want is to promote that. You want to promote the bigger picture. Yeah. Um, people often forget that during Olympic Games in the back uh, 500 uh, years, uh, people were punching faces with uh, metal plates uh, tied with laser. <laughs> so I guess. Everything is changing, uh, like uh, like Aline said, it's easier for us to promote, uh, to brand um, a content that is safe, that is almost uh, uh, ready for ICO. Uh, when you get to the chance to, to be on the Olympic Games, it, it's okay for a brand to join that. But as we try to address both uh, recreative players and e-gamers, we have to focus again and also on the 
most uh, violent games. Say violence, it's virtual violence. No one proved ever that uh, virtual violence led to physical and real violence. It's okay, like uh, like uh, like it's been said. Uh, society is like that. We have a business. Yeah. We run a business. We try to make opportunities, but we have some ethical borders uh, we want to uh, cross. I mean, when you've got uh, League of Legends, 100 million uh, active players, when you've got uh, Call of Duty or CS uh, go with f uh, 50, 50 million active players, you can just uh, put your hands on the, the front of your eyes and say, no, they don't exist, they don't want to be there. It's okay, and uh, they've got endemic brand uh, they can address, we will we'll address them, but also we try to, to get in, in the middle one, in the middle way, and uh, try to speak to everybody. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a very balanced uh, challenge, but that's the way we, yeah. we made up our business plan. So, I mean, um Basically, FIFA isn't the biggest game. It's not where all of the viewers are. It's not where we see all the hundreds of millions of people watched whatever final, the League of Legends final. Um, as a football club or a sports body going into eSports, to, to reach those numbers, it seems you have to go into those other titles. That's where the audience lives. Um, in terms of the audience, um, the average gamer um, and like you mentioned, Pablo, a gamer, most eSports fans are also gamers. They invest a lot of time and money in their systems. Um, but these are predominantly male, um, young. Is it yeah, Colin is an yeah. example of what an eSports fan looks like. <laughs> um, Thanks. But so it is, it is quite a young audience and it's a key target audience that you know, we all want to reach in football. Um, but we're struggling to, so eSports is actually where the rest of that audience sits. Um, do you find that with FIFA, there's a slightly different audience to the mainstream eSports audience, Colin? Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, the thing about people that play FIFA is that most of the people that I know that play FIFA usually just play FIFA or the other kind of casual titles, as we would call them, because there are people that call themselves gamers, and then there are people that play video games. I feel like there are people, like, I'm a gamer, right? I play, I don't just play FIFA, I play FIFA, I play CSGO, I play PUBG, I play all of the games, you know? But people that play FIFA, um, especially the people that play casually, um, mainly just play that game, or maybe they'll play FIFA and Madden and, you know, maybe Call of Duty, kind of those core titles. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely its own audience, but it's I th in in my opinion at least it's it's probably bigger that casual audience. If you can appeal to that entirety of that casual audience that just plays FIFA because maybe they support Liverpool and they want to go play a career mode with Liverpool or something like that, you know, um, that kind of audience is their own little ecosystem. There's obviously crossover. Like I'm not saying that everyone that plays FIFA only plays FIFA, but a predominant amount of them. And from what I've seen working in the content space in FIFA, um, definitely it's kind of they stay in their bubble. Um, like all of our professional gamers at, at AS Roman Fnatic, um, they primarily just play FIFA, or they'll just play FIFA and Call of Duty. So they kind of stick to their core titles. Okay, and um, Pablo, your your audience, um, do you find that the audience of the esports team are have come from your football club, or they move over to the football club? Are they also football fans? <laughs> Not necessarily. So we have football. It's curious because when you give your name to uh, eSports, your fan base of, uh, in this case, basketball, because our team, uh, eSports team is uh, Vasconia eSports, all Vasconia fans, in a way, follow the results if we're winning or losing, and right. <laughs> these kind of things. So you have a kind of uh, attention. Yeah. That maybe some of them uh, learn about the game, and um, most of them not. Uh, but at the end, it's, um, you get new, you get uh, these new, new people, young people inside of your environment that sooner or later you can, they can move from e-sport to traditional sport or not. Mm -hmm. So there's not a... Uh, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> um, Fred, the, the people who will sign up to your league are casual gamers or pretty decent gamers who have an aspiration to become a pro gamer. We know we'll find both 
uh, we'll get some uh, pro gamers or good amateur level uh, players uh, looking for a contract uh, because we offer something uh, the market don't uh, offer for middle level uh, players. We know we can reach uh, the salaries we were talking about, uh, like uh, two uh, two thousand grants or something. We we can face that, mm -hmm. but we'll address these uh, casual players, but also um, the the professional ones looking for a little stability in a world la that lacks some. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's the way we, we think we can achieve uh, something new, but. It's like a, it's like a challenge. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and obviously you mentioned you have a number of professional footballers who have invested in this. Um, y yeah. The, the will any of them compete Sorry? to become a pro gamer? <laughs> the, the any the career changes? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no. The, the first two ones uh, backing up for banking up for, for RS were Sofian Feguli. Uh, uh, playing in Turkey, and uh, Musa Sissoko. They're, in fact, they're uh, gamer, uh, they're occasional gamers. Okay, it's not like uh, uh, they've been. Uh, they're not Neymar. <laughs> like uh, he's gone his own uh, e game squad. Yeah. There are uh, NBA players that bought uh, a squad from uh, e game players. They are not that kind of a uh, player. They are casual. Uh, they are teasing each other uh, when they meet in a team of friends. But um, they know it's a uh, it's native for for them. Yeah. They are still young um, players. They are still young, and uh, when you get to meet your friends, they are like casual. Say, okay, take a FIFA, take a Counter Strike, and. The way uh, they look at uh, RS is not only uh, an investment. They want to grow the thing. They want to put the light on this uh, particular movement mm -hmm. uh, because it's their generation. Uh, you talked about uh, 18 to 35 uh, year old uh, uh, average gamer. That's, uh, that's, that's the target because yeah. they're right into it. And those players will act as mentors to these pro game potential pro gamers. Yeah. And it, there's a lot of similarity between e-gamers and pro footballers. Um, there's some somehow they just taken from home and put in an environment where money is just quite easy. Mm -hmm. uh, when you pay uh, nothing because uh, you're provided a home, you're provided a taxi driver, you're provided a medical insurance, and the mistakes uh, they can avoid. Yeah. The mistakes they avoided, uh, they, they will mentor our team to avoid that too. We know uh, it's a pre pretty uh, uh, unstable world, and the pro gamers uh, have uh, maybe uh, uh, some of them can last for until uh, 25, uh, 30, but yeah, most lucky. of them uh, have a short uh, career, yeah. and what we'll uh, aim to do is to, to help them uh, make a good career if they can make a living of the, out of it, but uh, to prepare the, the next step of their life. Too. Okay. Um, so in that, there, you know, obviously working at Fnatic, we, we have a whole roster of, of professional gamers um, around the world who have professional contracts. There's a transfer market. There's all of that. Um, for you, Pablo, uh, you obviously have a structure and, um, in place for your football club and your basketball club. Um, your esports team, do they get these benefits also? Like, did they have a nutritionist? Did they yeah. have a psychologist? Yeah, we treat them like a, like a professional club, like a prof uh, professional sportsman. They have the facilities, they have the, the, all the services around the club, the mental coach and everything. Nutritionist is taking longer because <laughs> the, the, <laughs> yeah, the menu they use is not uh, <laughs> very often Pizza. as healthy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and Colin, obviously, with um, AS Roma. Um, you know, Fnatic AS Roma players are scattered. They're not in one place like Pablo's team. Um, do you get the benefits of an AS Roma professional football club even though the guys are scattered or could uh, you? If we were in Rome, 
uh, they would be more than willing to offer those services, but because we're not, it's much harder for that to happen. Um, but they do receive other benefits, you know, of being a part of AS Roma. You know, they've all been to Rome. They've all met, you know, the club president. They've all, you know, met Raja Nyangolan and Ed Njeko and all the top players there and have had built relationships. Our Italian player goes there all the time and, you know, was at their training camp and, you know, has made videos with Florenzi and, you know, a lot of our De Rossi and all of kind of the storied players at, at Roma. But when it comes to like the nutritionists and all that kind of stuff, until we kind of get a, a base camp set up, whether that be in Rome or, or somewhere else, it's harder to definitely take full advantage of, of those benefits. Yeah. So. Um, and do you think it's required uh, for an esports team to have those that kind of structure like a prof an, another professional sports team? Uh, no, not at all. <laughs> um, you can uh, most most teams right now. I think actually every single team that has a FIFA team right now doesn't have a team house for that team, so there isn't that structure in place. Um, but I think in the future that that will definitely come about, especially when as more money keeps coming into the eSport and as more teams come in, everyone's going to want to one-up each other. So if we were to get a base camp or something, I'm sure PSG would then come out and try and build one as well. So, um, but yeah, no, it's, it's been interesting. Yeah. So Fred, you, you plan for once you have your pro team roster that they will have a gaming house. Yeah. Um, a gaming house by game. So... We uh, we try to achieve that. It's cost uh, a lot of money. We are we are, we are okay with that. Uh, the localization is not yet determined. Um, the fact is that we believe that when you pretend to be uh, a, a, sport, a sport player, you got to act like a sport player. Yeah. So you got to get fit. You got to uh, avoid uh, too many uh, late uh, late night uh, parties. And the fact is. When you prove your value uh, when playing, it's okay for little yeah. things to, to come. But we, we try to... The mentors, they will bring that. Okay, the football players, they, can't just, they just can't uh, be uh, what they were when they were 15. Before, yeah, okay. yeah, exactly. When you enter the professional world, they are con you get constrained, it's okay. But you're professional, you paid for that. Yeah. So you, you've got to take the, the world package. You can just say, okay, uh, take the money and uh, <laughs> still have parties. That yeah. can be done this way. Well, so, Pablo, speaking about like, the professional contracts and um, you know, the business model as a whole, going into esports, you know, it's not like any other sports industry. We, we spoke earlier about um, you know, the cost of running a club. Uh, operationally, it's relatively the same year on year, depending on any you know big major investments around infrastructure or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. But and salaries in football and other sports, you know, obviously go up every year. We know, but um, in esports, operational costs and salaries and everything else seems to change, go up every single year. So how have you guys found it as an investment? Um, is it all rosy? Is it all big numbers? Well, um, we, take, we take advantage of the uh, structure we have for the classic sports, like, uh, I don't know, uh, administration, marketing, sales, sales team, communication. So uh, we have some synergies in there. And then it's a, it's a question of, of market. Now the, the, the salaries are increasing because the sponsors are arriving, because the audience is growing. So. At the end of the day, it's a question of, of, of size of the market. Mm -hmm. the, 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 operating of, the operation of an uh, eSport club is very similar to a normal club. Right. The, in fact, the, the, the big difference between eSport and traditional sport is that the football, uh, nobody owns the football. Or that's what we like to think. Uh, as somebody owns FIFA, yeah. somebody owns League of Legends, and yeah. somebody owns the rest of the, of the group, of the games. So you have a new player that is the publisher that owns the game and change it. We're waiting for the new version of FIFA. It's coming soon, so it's changing the, the game. It's a new game. It's a version. It's a new version of the same game. Mm -hmm. And new games are coming, and uh, some games are going down. Yeah. So the publisher is the big difference between yeah. traditional sport and, yeah. and sport. The managing of the club is no big difference. So today you will have you know, X number of teams in, in X number of titles, but tomorrow 
like you know we've seen the stats on PUBG, which yeah. is is not even launched yet <laughs> and huge. there's more people watching that than anything else on twitch so you know as an organization within esports you need to potentially prepare to add a roster in that title a gaming house and everything that comes with it well the gaming we only have gaming house for league of legends right because the audience is uh, 70% of the market, 75. You can afford in to. The, in the other g there. games, with everybody's playing at home. So the cost of, of taking a new team or buying another one is very low because you just have to contact the, the players yeah. and they are home and yeah. it's no big difference. Right. So for us, the, the, changing, the cost of change from one sport to the other, from one game to the other is nothing. Okay, so... Um, Speaking of new titles and new games, obviously FIFA 18 is coming out. Yeah. The, the big um, issue with FIFA 17 was that um, it's not great to watch. It's not a great viewing experience. It's not competitive enough. Um, Colin, you've had the, the pleasure of previewing it um, without obviously breaking your NDA. Mm -hmm. How do you feel uh, FIFA 18 will um, sustain the FIFA eSports position um, next year and beyond? Yeah, um, FIFA 18 is uh, it's great, it's a lot better than 17. Uh, so if you play FIFA, that should make you happy. Um, and uh, without saying too much, the vision of EA and, and what they've kind of told the teams at the top um, really makes us excited. For, for next year and uh, the way that esports is trending in general. And um, I'm sure, as some of the clubs here know, like I'm sure more clubs are going to be joining every month, um, especially rolling into FIFA 18. Um, and there are a lot of really good players left out there. So if you do want to pick up a player, uh, now is definitely the time. Um, <laughs> but with, with 18 and, and the way it plays, especially, because I have been able to play it multiple times now, and obviously the, the, the pre-builds are not always a complete replica, because there's usually, in the first couple weeks, there's a patch that changes the gameplay slightly. But the main issue last year was that you could literally not touch a defender and basically be able to defend. So control a central midfielder or a striker and bring them back, and then it's horrible to watch because basically the AI is playing for you, which is what no one wants to see. It doesn't really d demonstrate skill as well. Um, defending's a lot harder now, and uh, there's a lot more goals in the games, and so I think you're gonna see the guys that are genuinely world-class rise to the top this year, and people that have maybe been riding on their defensive abilities than their scoring abilities uh, yeah. will kind of fall by the wayside a little bit. And um, exciting players like AS Roma's Poacher will, uh, you know, <laughs> be at the top going into next season. But yeah, no, it's it's really exciting, and this title is probably the most excited I've ever been for a new FIFA. And uh, I think it's trending more towards being a more competitive game in general. And because up until now, EA's goal was to make the most realistic simulation of football. Now their goal is to make a game that can be played competitively where the skill gap between that guy who is world class and you know me who's good at the game but not great um, make it so that they can just play me off the park instead of it being a close match. Because I just played Sneaky who's at your booth and lost one nil. Like it shouldn't be like that. You know, yeah. I should be getting skinned by those guys. Yeah. So yeah, it's it's exciting. And I know a lot of pros that have played the game as well, and they have agreed with my assessment thus far, and uh, they're excited for the game just as much as I am. So. so do you think FIFA will be able to compete with the likes of League of Legends when it comes to live events? Not this year. Um, I think in the future, definitely. Um, but we're still scaling. It's scaling really well, obviously. Um, I think you'll see at least probably a 100% increase in, in viewership and in prize pool and, and all of those things. So like I said, you know, if clubs are looking to get involved right now, it's definitely the time. Um, but I still think we're probably another three or four years off of reaching that, being able to fill stadiums and, and that type of viewership. But I definitely think it's on the way. So, so do you think um, if there were clubs here, you would you're obviously saying you're encouraging them to get involved now in terms of time at which FIFA 18 is released, but mm -hmm. in terms of like now versus three years time when it is yeah. more built up and there is more of a sustainable structure in place, mm -hmm. um, when is the time, when is the right time? 
Um, it kind of depends on, on your vision. You know, if, if you believe in what I'm telling you, if, uh, if you believe the way the game is trending right now, I think right now is definitely the time as well. There are so many good players available right now where I think in six months' time, you'll struggle to find a, a top tier player that's willing to join your organization. Um, and I think the way that you pick your player is really important as well because some clubs, in my opinion, haven't done it necessarily the, the best way. Because um, there are different ways to pick your player, whether that be you go out and you scout players and you interview players and you figure out who fits your club ethos as well as who's the, uh, the best player on paper as well. Because like, like we said earlier, 17 is a really hard game to judge players off of because of the, the skill gap and how small it was. You know, one guy can go in and win a tournament one day and then the next day lose every single game. You know, so it's very, very different. But, uh, but getting involved right now is definitely, in my opinion, the, the best time because you'll be able to get a top class player for honestly a very, very low investment initially. It's probably the cheapest esport to get involved in, in my opinion, because you're only paying one player. Yeah. And you can pick up one player or you can go like us and pick up different regions, which opens you up to a lot more tournaments and a lot more, uh, a bigger range of prize pools. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of like how, how much you want to buy into it, right. you know? So. And how long term your your vision exactly. is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, for you, Fred, it's it's obviously a really exciting time now because you're currently receiving signups for your leagues. Um, you know, in terms of FIFA and what Colin says, and if he's right with his prediction of it being the start of something really great for the whole entire FIFA kind of competitive scene, um, it must be quite. Um, like, was it deliberate that you did it now and not waited, or you know, you didn't do it a few years ago? What, what why now? Why are you doing it now? Why now? Because um, maybe it's the it, it, it's the right time. We've been monitoring the market for for a while now, and when you've got uh, players like PK. Uh, trying to enroll uh, e-gamers when you've got uh, uh, Deportivo or AS Roma. Uh, and once again, we've talked to a lot of uh, football club longing to structure um, this, this game. Okay, you, you've talked about FIFA and not even about uh, Pro Evolution Soccer. Mm -hmm. That means, okay, just, okay, <laughs> you can hide uh, just behind. It would be FIFA or nothing. And for us, uh, as we, our ambassador is just uh, uh, pro players, we can't even imagine not being uh, FIFA and not being a yeah. top, uh, top playing FIFA team. But uh, as, the, as uh, you mentioned, uh, the price is rising pretty fast. Yeah. And if you've been here beaten by Nathan, uh, Nathan was uh, cheap few months ago is not anymore so yeah. uh, I guess it's the right time for a mid-level organization like ours we don't have the financial powers of uh, AS Roma or, or big clubs so if you want if we want to be uh, a major actor of this uh, movement it's right now get in now while you yeah. can afford it yeah. yeah yeah no I think that's important too to realize is that right now you can pick up a player for a very inexpensive amount but how quickly their salaries are going up from just last year to this year is incredible. So, you know, right now, the investment for you for the year might be like twenty or thirty thousand dollars, let's just say as an example, mm -hmm. where in two years it could be a hundred to a hundred and fifty thousand for one player, you know? Right. So it's really like you kind of have to decide like is it worth for us to get in now and kind of have a lower risk or, you know, wait two years and the player might cost a lot more than you think initially. Yeah. So. And you just missed the boat. Yeah. Pablo, you were going to say yeah, something. I mean, this, uh, there are many, many uh, new publishers like NBA, F1. They're, making, they're trying to make an uh, eSport business around. And then they are, they are using new version of the games. Everybody's excited. The reality is we have to wait. Because now NBA is playing every week. It's a very nice new newspaper. Every, every morning before the match, you can play one against the other. You have a content for your Twitter account, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing else till now. We will see if uh, it becomes a sport, mm -hmm. it's become a, a, in a professional way, but today it's just a, a project. Yeah. 
Yeah. So to finish up, I think um, I'd be interested to hear your predictions about, you know, in terms of, I think we've covered the fact that football hasn't really come up much in any of this conversation. FIFA is not football. Um, it is an esports title. Um, so I think it's, it's quite interesting for, you know, everyone to be quite clear on that, that people who are already in esports have already forgotten football. <laughs> So it, it's a completely separate entity. And for you, Pablo, it is a separate business model to your esports model. Um, but I think in terms of predictions ahead, like for this year and next year, in terms of esports and not just FIFA, mm -hmm. um, where FIFA sits on it, um, how much will esports play a part in all of our lives in terms of this commercial world of sport, um, what you know, what do you guys see happening within the esports world? That is, you know, we, we talked earlier about how something is true today. Tomorrow yeah. it will be completely different. There'll be something completely. Uh, so like it, it's rapidly changing. And I think for each of you, you all have different views based on your, where you stand. So Colin, have you got any major predictions of what's going to happen in the year ahead? Uh, I think by the end of next year, you'll probably see in the top five, six, seven leagues, 75 to 80 percent of the clubs will probably have esports players. And I think you're already seeing every single Dutch club has an esports player. Pretty much every single French club already has an esports player. And I think that at this point, if you're a club and you're looking at esports, or if you're a brand and you're looking at esports and you're not at least considering getting involved at this point, it's a little bit silly. Um, just because there is so much potential and there is so much proven um, value in what, we, what we've done and what we can do in the future. So I think, uh, yeah, I just think it's only gonna get bigger. And uh, yeah, I don't know, that was a bad, okay. bad prediction, but. Okay, Fred? I guess it would depend on whether uh, the football make it to the Olympics. I mean, when, when you've got the last uh, FIFA Interactive uh, World Cup, there were just like what, uh, 100,000, 100,000 people watching. But uh, if you reach to the Olympics, there will be millions, billions of people. The last uh, World Cup, the physical World Cup, was just viewed by one billion people. Once you make that boost, mm. uh, it just, the way the, game, the gameplay of FIFA is uh, is moving forward. It's like the Pixar cartoon. Once you start forgetting that you're watching a cartoon and just say, wow, it <laughs> looks like real one. Yeah. This would bring the emotion to the, to the game. And maybe that's what uh, will move FIFA forward. As soon as people will uh, watch uh, FIFA uh, game yeah. as they would they watch a football game, mm -hmm that would bring brand to be uh, much more present on that one and uh, people to consume football like they are. Uh, like so if, if the IOC do decide to have football for say Paris 2024, do we blame you or, or FIFA? I mean, do we blame you or will you be campaigning for that? <laughs> I don't have Tony Estangi numbers, but uh, yeah, as soon as we can have a competitive uh, FIFA team, yeah, yeah. that's what we, we want to do. But uh, we forget a lot of bad dads, uh, but Olympics are all about nation. So uh, if you want to compete the Olympics, we have to, to have uh, pro uh, FIFA players uh, representing a, a country. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's not yet. Uh, it's not happened, but it could. Yeah, it's not yeah. yet on the, on the disc. Yeah. Pablo, predictions? Well, uh, I don't know which game we're going to play, and then we don't really care. Um, the, what I see from the brand's point of view, that at the beginning, only um, keyboards and uh, mouses and headphones and brands that were in place. Later on, mobile companies, IT, um, pizza, and fast food companies mm -hmm. are in place. And what I'm seeing the next year that the, the rest of the brands will come in. Yeah. So we will see uh, cars, we'll see banks, mm -hmm. we'll see insurance company, we'll see everything yeah. uh, well, around this part. We already, we already see it, already like here. Audi, BMW, yeah. Gillette, 
they're all there yeah. um, on a small scale, but they're starting to scale yeah. up. So you you feel it'll yeah. As up. soon as they get the 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 return, yeah, uh, they will increase the investment, and everybody's going in. Well, it's a scary space for most people, um, yeah. but the the results are proven. Um, yeah. It is everyone yeah. is online. They're always online, um, and they talk a lot. So whether you're a brand, a team. Um, you will have ready-made people who are desperate to consume this content. Um, and it's, as much as it's pretty foreign to most of us, it's a reality. And we're just all going to have to go with it. Like when Ireland changed the euro, we just had to adjust. <laughs> um, if we have a little bit of time, um, questions we've got. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeffrey Blossett from the Washington Redskins of the NFL and a casual Overwatch player. Um, thank you very much for this. Uh, my question is in regards to, I guess, our sport, Madden. Um, over in the United States, the Madden, their Madden scene in terms of competitive esports is not really existent. And clubs have a very hard time of, you know, activating on that, or at least, you know, in a mainstream kind of sense. And we have a very hard time trying to activate, but I know there have been talks, you know, from teams where it's like, okay, we want to activate with esports related stuff. We just don't know how. I mean, I would have ideas just because I've played and watched and things like that. But what would you recommend to say a club or a team that might not be ready yet to invest in creating a, a, a direct esports team, but saying activating on the esports side of things? Um, creating content for that, really enhancing the partnership with, say, uh, an EA Sports and a Madden, and, and creating something that's exciting for the fans. Like, what are some strategies that you would recommend for that? Uh, just some things that I've seen uh, different clubs put into place. Um, like, I worked a lot with Sporting Kansas City when I lived in Kansas, and some of the activations they would do would be either to kind of have their uh, footballers like play the game and then create content through that because the players do play the game and there's different ways that you can get the players to engage without necessarily like signing a dedicated esports player as well. Um, one way was they got their community engaged by, I think you've seen other clubs already do this, but put the game on site at your stadium or at your event and then like the younger fans can come and have their own dedicated space to kind of consume your club or uh, your team or your players in different ways um, and maybe even have one of the players at that event and then they can play with the player and then as well um, they've thrown like different independent um, like tournaments where maybe the prize is like game tickets instead of you know a contract um, those are really great ways to, to get your kind of younger base engaged without necessarily going out and like buying the $150 ticket or whatever. It's a great way to get them engaged and then you can create content around that and then you know your younger fans can get engaged through that way instead of necessarily going to the stadium which isn't as prevalent as it used to be. So you had a question? Uh, Florence Lloyd Hughes from Sport Cal. Um, Fred's kind of made his opinions clear on this one but I just want to ask the rest of the panel you sort of touched on it but do you think it would be a mistake for the IOC to use FIFA as its gateway to, to esports and we did touch on a little bit but sort of more specifically anyone I mean I, I worked for London 2012 so I have opinions <laughs> about esports and now I work for esports but I mean I don't know how you guys feel about it but I, I think esports is the future of how young kids are consuming sport and entertainment. Um, I don't think it would be a mistake from IOC, but I think the IOC values are very different and encourage a completely different message to that of esports. Um, you know, it's about inclusion, it's about participation, it's about, you know, not always, well, it is active, it's sport. Um, I don't know if it translates the same, but I definitely think there, there is a scope and for something. There's one thing, there's a publisher. So you're playing a game that somebody owns. So in the Olympic Games, you normally play, yeah. you know, nobody, yeah, like owns, nobody the owns the rest football. of the sport. You have to reach an agreement with somebody to play their game in the Olympics. So this is the side I don't see. It's like, it's like playing Monopoly. Yeah. And asking the owners of Monopoly, can we, you know, make your game an Olympic sport? Yeah. Like, it's really difficult and knowing IOC 
it's not as plain as, as maybe the, the concept, but I do think there is a balance there. There, should, there is something there um, that could happen because the reality is the way the kids consume sport and entertainment now is digital. Um, so they need to figure out a way to, to adapt to that new audience. What it is, who knows? <laughs> Anyone else with a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> Hello, my name is Sharif. Uh, my question is to Colin. I've got two questions. So initially, you said that um, clubs are not using the right strategy, in your opinion, to recruit esports players. So what would you recommend as the right strategy? And then my second question is that uh, within your organization, what's the perception of esports or specifically FIFA in the African continent? OK. It's actually funny because re regarding your second question, we actually went down to South Africa um, this summer to compete in a tournament. So we kind of got uh, to see kind of the South African esports uh, kind of uh, scene. And it was really interesting. Um, I feel like they're, they're trying to embrace it in a, in a really new way. And there are companies down there, especially, that are willing to put money into the esport. Um, VS Gaming is, is a company that I think if they uh, put their money in the right places when, when it comes to the production side and getting the, the game out there when it comes to the African fan base, they can do some really cool stuff. Um, outside of South Africa, I don't have a lot of experience in Africa, but uh, they seem to be like really getting into it. And um, I think if they can continue the way that their trajectory is going with doing these different events and involving like the footballers, they had some of the South African national team players come down and um, they were really engaging with like the fans and the pros and like engaging with the game in general. So that was really cool to see. Um, and then, uh, what's the first question? Uh, how, would you, how would you advise? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the best? The wrong way? They should yeah, hire yeah. you, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> hire me, I'll find you a player. Um, no, but the, the best practice, in my opinion, is to find someone who knows the scene. Because if you just go out there and you're like, oh, this guy won ESWC in 2014, that means nothing now, you know? Like, a guy could be a world champion last year, but that doesn't really mean a lot because the game changes so much title to title that you need people that um, are worth investing in as human beings and as, you know, assets to your organization outside of just their competitive ability because the team I've put together, they're all really good players there are probably players that we could have signed that were like one or two percent better, but these people I know we can work with and have the drive and have the hunger to be as good as they want to be. And um, as well, we, we've kind of like went with potential as well, so you can kind of maybe pick up a 24 or 25 year old guy that might be maybe 5% better than that 18 year old. But that 18 year old has a lot of years left, has a good five or six years. And depending on your scope as well, on how long you wanna be in esports, it's something to consider. So if this is something that you think, oh, this is a two year activation, then you can go out and pick up the, the older guy that might only have a couple years left on his lifespan. But please, just there's a couple of ways that I haven't seen it go as well, um, which is, just doing a tournament and saying all of the people in our area come and compete and the winner gets to be our player. It's a very dangerous thing to do because anyone can win that individual tournament, um, especially because the pool of players that you're pulling from is probably not gonna be of the highest quality and especially if you wanna have your guy be at the top level, which is how you get the eyes on your player at the end of the day and on your brand. Um, you need to get that top player, so talking to someone like me or someone or a different esports organization that maybe already has those scouting lists laid out, that's probably the best way is to go and talk to them and figure out who the best players actually are and uh, who the best players and people to invest in are. So, um, Just to mention, Fnatic um, is obviously, we've been around for like 14 years. FIFA is a new title for us. Um, we partnered with AS Roma, but we do speak to a number of sports organizations in the States, um, in China, um, here in the UK and across Europe, and as a successful um, organization, we do offer guidance. Our biggest mission is to grow the ecosystem, so if anyone ever did have any questions, do contact Fnatic. We're very, very open. We're based in Shoreditch. Come down, say hi. Just saying. <laughs> anyone else with a question before we finish up? Oh. Hi, uh, Kieran from XL Esports. Um, I just want to kind of touch upon what uh, Colin has just said there. 
And uh, I obviously, as an owner of an esports organisation myself, agree with the, the method for a football club to talk to an esports organisation to then go into FIFA. But who I really want to ask a question to is Pablo, because you guys have kind of gone over from traditional sports into the esports arena. Um, how did you guys make that transition? Was it organic? Did you have people in your organisation that knew about esports, or did you seek help from an esports organisation in Spain to do so? Well, in, in our general manager is an esport fan, so he likes he knows about uh, esports as much as he knows about football, and uh, and then we, we had a small club in our city that we get, and then at the beginning we get the infrastructure, infrastructure for them, and then we grow, and then we contact people from from outside. But it's almost the same that, uh, that we open a baseball uh, new section it will be almost the similar similar mechanism. Yeah. Hi there, um, my name's Robin from Crystal Palace Football Club. Um, I know you touched on it, Colin, um, with AS Roma and how there's only one uh, Italian player yeah. playing for them. Um, in an ideal world, though, would you have that player from that local area or with some sort of connection with that football club? Or does it, is it really just about finding that best player? Um, in an ideal world, it would be nice if our player grew up a Roma fan and, you know, had always been a Roma fan. But we're pretty transparent about the fact that, you know, like he loves the club and, you know, he really enjoys playing for the club. But I don't think it's absolutely necessary in the same way that, you know, the guys, when they play competitively, when they play with their ultimate teams, they don't play with the AS Roma team, you know, in the same way that if there was a Palace player, they wouldn't play with the Palace team, just because that doesn't put them in the best situation to then go and win those tournaments. Because when they go to a tournament, they're using Ronaldo, they're using Messi, they're using, you know, Pogba, they're using Hullet, you know, legends and people like that. So, uh, yeah, I think I'd, in an ideal world it would be nice because there are some esports organizations, or sorry, some football clubs that have some great players from their areas, but to actually know that they exist is a very tough ask for clubs. Um, and if you want me to hook you up with a London-based player, <laughs> let me know, and I'll let you know who's, who's good in the area. But no, um, it would be nice, but yeah, I, I would just say primarily go for the best player because I think you can especially if it's an open-minded esports player. And a lot of these guys are young, um, and a lot of them don't have teams in general, um, are willing to embrace a new club and embrace the culture. And uh, I think just from speaking to them as well, just speak to the players, you know, because I think you'll get a good idea in the same way of when you talk to a footballer, if their attitude and the way they handle themselves and on social media especially, like if that gels with the way that you want your club presented, so. Okay, uh, that's all the time we May have. May I say something? Oh. It's like a strange question, in fact, because your organization, when dealing with uh, physical football, they won't pick uh, London players only, but uh, they will bring uh, the best uh, people available. So why don't you mimic uh, the football side? I guess the, the, the best way, the best practice for eSport now is to mimic the good practice of every spot you can find, uh, Maiden, Maiden is a good uh, is a good uh, game. But if you can't mimic the way the super organized uh, franchise do, don't don't do it. I mean, you're the best among the best of your uh, of your domain. Be the best of your domain in the uh, esports too. Yeah. Choose to be uh, the the best ones. I would just I would just say like get someone in your country is what I'm saying like pick yeah. up a UK player yeah. because you need someone that can travel that but, doesn't but cost if you can like get a thousand dollars. Okay. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. you but get Neymar if you can get Neymar. Exactly. Yeah. Or if you want, you can like. It's, I think it's important to have someone there though. That'd yeah. Be, like definitely for us, having, having an Italian player is very important yeah. because then he can engage in the language. Because yeah. if we had someone that couldn't even communicate with the fans, yeah. it would look a little bad. So yeah. if you went out okay. and signed a. Mm -hmm a player from Spain that couldn't speak English and that was your only player, then yeah, that would look great. So yeah, just get a player that's in your country. You don't want a Bartley situation yeah. at the press conference. Yeah. Um, okay, cool. That's all the time we have. Thanks so much for coming. And obviously we're around, so if you have any questions afterwards, do please get in touch. Thanks. Yeah.